Hey folks, welcome to this new episode of System Design Charcha. Uh, we'll be talking about LinkedIn connections, how LinkedIn stores them, but most importantly, how queries happen uh, on LinkedIn. So if you're searching for first degree, second degree, third degree connections, how can LinkedIn get those connections to you very quickly? So for example, I am connected to Gaurav and then Gaurav is connected to Blossom. Then Blossom is my second degree connection. And suppose Blossom is connected to someone else, then that person is my third degree connection. So We have across 1 billion users on LinkedIn. Every person has around what, 1000 connections, which is basically yes. first degree connections is what we are talking about. So mm -hmm. these 1000 people, again connected to 1000 people, so that becomes 1000 to 1000, which is 1 million second degree connections. And if we have to see third degree, then it will become 1000 cube, which essentially becomes our entire user Everybody, base. Yeah. <laughs> yes, everyone. Right. So if we have to see this can be our aim for today, that if we have to find the third degree connections for everyone. Yeah. If you get a query, get me my third degree connections. Yeah. The easiest way to manage this would be just brute force. So in SQL, it will look something like select connections uh, from the connection table. So select star connection where user uh, their ID is equal to our current user. So let's say current user ID is one to three. And then we have the second degree connections select star from connection where user ID in this. Okay. So because you want distinct users, maybe you want select distinct user ID. Okay. Uh, pretty simple. You're basically firing one query and another inner query to, to get all connection data. If you do this, okay. yeah, I mean, if you just fire this query, it's going to take you order n square time. Okay. Where n is the degree uh, of, or rather n is the number of connections that a person has. 1 million nodes in any database is not fun to query, it will take you uh, hundreds of milliseconds to go through this. If you do it for thousands of queries per second, this is going to happen not only uh, with people are trying to look for connections, but it's also going to be many automated queries in your backend will need connection data. So thousands of queries and you have hundreds of milliseconds. If you want, you, it just isn't fast enough, right? So in terms of time, it's going to be many seconds in total. Correct. So, uh, yeah, that will be like uh, hundreds of servers just managing these kind of queries and hundreds of servers, not, not exactly because you need a lot of database queries also. So you'll have to scale up your database. It's a very expensive way to do this. It's not ideal. Right. Another way to see it, like Gaurav told in terms of queries, another way to see it in very simple terms, if you're doing BFS on number, if the number of connections is n, then for first degree, it is order of n, correct? And mm -hmm. for second degree, it will essentially become order of n square. Yeah. Right, Gaurav? Uh, yeah. And for third degree, it will basically become order of n cube. Yeah. Now, a question to all of you also. I hope you all are thinking it yourself as well. That if, you know, we are taking order of n cube in BFS, how can we optimize this a bit? Uh, so a very simple and a very common solution is to do bi-directional BFS. So let's assume uh, Kirti has these people as their first as a first degree connections, and Gaurav is somebody who she found on a search result. So she wants to see how far Gaurav is from her uh, in terms of connection hops. So these are first degree connections. These are her second degree connections. We first compute these people. They help us compute second degree. Now we could compute third degree also and eventually fourth degree. And then when we find Gaurav in the fourth degree, we say Gaurav is a fourth degree connection. But instead of doing that, which is going to be computationally very expensive, it's going to be order, order of n raised to the Yeah, four. Yeah. So it's going to be like really, really uh, far away. We instead start moving from the destination also. So this is the bi-directional part of BFS. 
from Gaurav, we find his first degree connections. And then we say, okay, is there a match between Kirti and Gaurav? If there is, then Kirti and Gaurav are at a distance of three, right? Because there's, if you find a match, if these two users are the same, then you know that Kirti is distance one away from this person. Gaurav is distance one away from this person. Uh, that means they are one plus one, two degrees away. Okay. Uh, but if that is not the case, then you find the second degree connections of Kirti. And then you see if there's any match. If there is, then you know that the distance between them is two plus one, which is one, two, three, uh, and four. Yeah. Now that we have this, if you really want to find Gaurav's, uh, I mean, you want to find further connections, then you can do the same thing. Uh, let's say Gaurav has these people as their, as his second degree connections. And if you see a match here, then you know that the distance is one, two, three, four. Fourth degree connection can be found. So this really helps us bring down the order complexity from order n raised to power four, like Kirti mentioned, to order n square. So okay. uh, in terms of order complexity, it can't be better than this, unless you're, I don't know, what machine learning or some shit. <laughs> unless you have that. Uh, but th in terms of algorithm complexity, this is acceptable. Okay, okay, because 1 million connections for a user uh, will be searched. So that's okay. Now, even this is not good enough. A uh, brute force approach has only optimized on the algorithm, but there are some practical aspects which are still a problem. Firstly, uh, running a BFS or running a join uh, on a table, like you're going to run two joins, one for Gaurav and one for Kirti. Yeah, that's what basically this query is going to translate to. In real time, if you try to do this, it will be hundreds of milliseconds again. So that's not ideal. Uh, what can we do to avoid this? Right. Even when we have to do BFS, getting the data again and again from the DB, yeah. like from the disk to memory and then computing, then doing BFS is expensive. So one very yeah. obvious solution that should come to all of us is basically caching. Now, yeah. Again, storing all of this data on cache seems hard, right? This is, we are talking essentially about millions of people. So yeah. how do we store the entire thing on cache? Is that next problem to think about? Yeah. Firstly, you need to earn a lot of money like LinkedIn because you need to be able to afford all these cache servers. Uh, interview ready will still take some time to get there. But uh, if you, or rather, of course, when you are rich enough and you really care about query latency, uh, what you can do is break the cache into pieces. So you have a set of users who go to one cache, say cache one, a uh, set of users who go to another cache, which is cache two, another set go to cache three. The reason why we're splitting into multiple caches is because we can't store all of the connection data for all users in one cache. If we are assuming 1 million connections per user, and you have 1 billion users. If this is really what we are uh, assuming, then it's going to be uh, not 1 trillion, 1000 trillion entries. So there's no way that a single cache can store that much. Okay. Yeah. Also, uh, to like simplify it even uh, more a bit, that we would be obviously storing all our users, the first connections on DP, but do we need to store the second degree connections, third degree connections on DP? Kara, what do you think? Do we need to store them oh, yeah. on DP? No, I don't think so. I think this query is, is good where you have like a single degree is good. If you want to store second degree, we can do that. But I mean, I would rather compute it in memory because the second degree changes a lot. So the DB will need to have a lot of update queries also fired into it. So instead just store it in a denormalized single degree way. So Gaurav is connected to Kirti or Gaurav is connected to this user. You have this information, but you don't have second degree. Correct. So this is what the table. So will basically look like, yeah. in, in disk, we will have basically Kirti is connected to these people. Gaurav is connected to these people not the second degree connections, not the third degree connections, but we'll have to compute them and keep them in memory. 
right? Yeah. So since we're already talking about databases, uh, it's it's good that we will quickly discuss a bit about which DB and which uh, cache can you use, right? So yeah. a very very common graph based databases are basically Neo4j, Netune, uh, which we could definitely use over here. It is uh, very much optimized for graph based queries. Uh, there is basically also Cypher for, to run queries, which is very, very good for all graphical queries, like to, to, to find the shortest distances like BFS and all. It is very optimized for that. Uh, coming to the caching part. So interestingly, Redis also has something called Redis Graph. So it is a wrapper on top of Redis Key Store. And they are trying to store, like it recently came, it is not like very old. Uh, but they are basically trying to store the graph in memory. And it also offers persistence, but like because we have to deal with cache, Redis Graph is a very good option over here. Actually, that's a really good point, Kirti. If it is an in-memory DB, then maybe running these queries is going to be super efficient on Redis. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, this yeah. part is, I think uh, we are good here. After this, once we have found second degree connections, there is another problem. Uh, and, and the problem is if your cache fails, if this breaks, then what happens? Wait, let's just say this cache one, it failed. So a set of users with their first connections or rather uh, a set of users with their second degree connections was lost. So to take so an example, let's them again. Yeah. So now if we have to compute them again, is that, is that going to be fun? Basically every time you fire this query, when you're computing them at some point in time, you have to go to the DB and do this. It's unavoidable. You're caching because you're hoping that when the real query comes, it'll be fast. And plus you'll be able to reuse this data. But the first time for the cache to load up, it will have to fire these queries from DB. So, we don't have any fault tolerance. If a cache crashes, we have to rebuild it. Uh, and that is affecting our latency. So what do you think is a decent option? Also, Gaurav, I, I think we missed discussing one very important point that yeah. when do we compute the second degree, third degree connection? Like suppose when I send a connection request to you, like do mm -hmm. we compute at that time or when is it computed? I think Initially, uh, what we should do is we should keep all active user second degree connections in cache. So this can be like a LRU cache. A person comes, does stuff, and then they leave and they don't come back for a while. So this cache can have a replacement policy of LRU. Uh -huh. When they come and they try to get their second degree connections, we can compute it for them uh, in real time. And if right. I send a new connection request to you, do we update at like do we update the cache at that time? I think we should. So for example, if you send me a connection request and I accept, then mm -hmm. what should happen is keep these first degree connections update themselves and I just add this person and their connections, their first degree connections to her second degree. Right. That updation okay. needs to happen in real time. So anytime a person accepts a connection or removes a connection we should, uh, we need to do that. Okay. Now, removing okay. a connection is complex because it's possible that Gaurav uh, is connected to A and Kirti is connected to A and somebody removes me as a connection. So if they okay. do that and they're connected to Kirti, they should still have that thing working for them. So I don't know how this is going to be resolved, but uh, additions are easy comparatively. Removals are a little more complex. Maybe we want to do this like with an eventual consistent thing, which is Correct. it's a background job that's constantly running. Yeah, because uh, it is not a big deal that if we see someone as second connection or third connection, even if they are not, even if they recently disconnected, it is fine if we eventually see it that okay they got disconnected. Yeah, yeah. First degree is a real problem, but second degree right. is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We have this. Uh, we were talking about the fact that you know. Uh, if a cache crashes, then all of this is lost. All of this, uh, all of this data has to be recomputed, which is expensive. So how do we do this efficiently? So on cache startup, 
we can start firing these queries on the db but that's going to be uh, it is going to be intense i don't think it can be avoided what else can we do replication always the yeah. answer whenever something goes down <laughs> yeah so uh, like you said kithi so if you have a replication so you have the first cache replicated multiple in multiple places maybe you have one in india maybe you have one in us one in europe uh, so the benefit of having this replication is uh, updates are rare but reads are often you have fault tolerance so when if this these two caches are down you still have this one alive So and you brought a very important it. point that if one cache is in India, one cache is in US. So basically, you're also taking care of that. If I if I am in India and I have to get information from the cache in US, it is obviously expensive. So replication solves that problem. So it is helping us yeah. with latency as well. Yes, it it could yeah. Also, like uh, a lot of times, people ask about you know how many replicas should we have. So what is the ideal replication factor according to you? Uh, if you are having, it depends on a few things. One is, you if you want just uh, fault tolerance, then replication factor of one is also okay because if one crashes, the other one is there. So there is mm-hmm. that uh, primary replica kind of architecture where you know one is just taking updates and eventually it becomes consistent, and you can do read queries on both. That's one. But if you are looking for like. Uh, you know you're doing replication because you want to increase read ti- or reduce read times so latency wants to uh, you want to take it down so in that case you want to maybe geo distribute it or even if you don't geo distribute if you have them all in one place you can fire queries you can load balance between those replicas so like this is a this is a similar case right yeah yeah like i'm saying 3 but there's no reason why it's 3 uh, i'm sure there are like a cdn for example is an example of replication factor being like let's say 10 or something because it's there in many places on earth but yeah if you're looking for fault tolerance only you're not really looking for latency then two is okay to just quickly summarize so we started with our capacity estimation we saw that okay there are 1 billion users we definitely checked out the brute force and we understood that it will not work out for us then we considered by directional bfs and even that would not be a very optimized solution so we talked about caching so i guess more or less we are done with this awesome see you bye bye